and Point North Consulting. Um, that will be available in the minutes of this meeting. Um, Dr. Riki Smith, are there any changes to the agenda? There are none, Chair. Um, all right, colleagues, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda. I move to approve the agenda as presented. Second. Motion's been made by Director Zerschmied and seconded by Director Jaime. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, we'll move to a choral vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. All right, motion passes and the agenda has been approved. Uh, with that, we will move into recognition and good news with our presenter, Lisa Burden. So good evening, everybody. Um, sorry. Okay, log me out of my computer here. Okay. okay. So today in recognition, sorry, in recognition and celebration of Black History Month and the TTSD Black community, I am joined by TTSD students and staff to share how schools are learning more about and celebrating Black history this month and throughout the year. Well, happy Black History Month. Um, I'm Octavia Horn. I'm the culturally responsive liaison for the district. Um, I just want to give an opportunity to share a little bit about um, our students and what they're doing in their affinity group. I'm sitting next to two students from the BSU, and they want to share a little bit about what they're going to be doing this month. So first, it will be Gianna Robertson. Hi, I'm the president of the Walton High School's um, Black Student Union. And tonight, I just want to share with you guys a presentation of our agenda, what we're going to plan on doing for this month. And um, some things that we've contributed, sorry, <laughs> you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, contributed to uh, for this month. Or you can go to the next slide. So our goals for this month is to celebrate African Americans and embrace our community and expose more to Tawalatan, um, some more of our people, just to celebrate our month. Next slide. Okay, so what I have here right now. Is some stickers that we have gotten and some cards that we had printed out as well. That we decided to give some teachers in our school and uh, have in our library as well. Just to share that, you know, happy Black History Month celebration. Yeah, as Octavia is gonna hand those out, um, I'm gonna continue. So we also made a list of uh, students who are gonna go to our, the Laser Black History Month event, which is gonna be on the 12th of February, which is a Saturday. We also ended up getting 50 different books uh, written by black authors. So um, that's one of the black authors, This Is My America. And then this is like a photo for them, for the people who are at home. So right here, this is for week two, which is this week. We started decorating um, our library shelf, with how we decide to um, have our agenda for the library. 
at the top of the uh, at the top of the shelf, we're gonna have artwork, which is also on the next slide. You can switch to the next slide as well. That's a better photo. So we have the artwork there, and then under it, we're gonna have a sign saying something probably like, you know, books written by black authors, and then it's chalk paint. So we're gonna have some artwork that we're gonna draw in the shelves as well. So we're gonna have the first row with more artwork. The second row is gonna have books, and then the third one will also have books, the fourth one, and then the bottom one's gonna have more artwork. And you can go to the next slide. These are, a, this is a picture of some of the artworks that we purchased. We've gotten a couple of more, but all of them have came yet, so. This is another picture. I can actually show you one of them too. Oh, that's beautiful. That's awesome. <laughs> a lot of the paintings are a lot bigger but that's the one i could carry home so <laughs> and then this image right here is the trailblazers this is the new york knicks who we're going to see you can go to the next slide please okay so in week four, we got a logo that we have designed. Um, we haven't ordered any masks yet, but we plan on ordering some masks and then hoodies that match it with our logo on it. So we're gonna start getting that kind of done. Our goal is to try to get that done by the fourth week of February. And then the next thing on our list is um, Solidarity Night, which is kind of like a celebration to celebrate black families together in the community of Walton and Tigard. We want to partner with Tiger High School as well, just to have a nice little potluck and celebrate Black History Month. So that's going to be the week where we kind of like have everything finalized. And then if you want, you can go to the next slide, please. It's also going to be Spirit Week too. We have early 2000s day, college prep, and uh, <laughs> yeah, in honor of uh, historical Black colleges and sororities as well. We have Jordan's Day. I've noticed a lot of Tualatin kids have a lot of Jordan ones. So I was like, hey, black people love Jordans. <laughs> so that works with it. Um, Solidarity Day as well, you know, wearing black gold and represented in representation, Black History Month. So. Go to the next slide, please. Thank you. This is an image of kind of how it's gonna look from left to right. Yeah. Okay, you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So um, week four is also a potential, uh, I guess, speaker day where we're gonna have someone come in, the author. We're still trying to work on that, but we haven't had any black authors to come and speak to us uh, or who have reached out and said that they're willing to but then this month, cause it's kind of late, which I understand. So that's kind of just on our agenda what we wanted to also include. But then on the right, we talk more about like um, solidarity and I, which we're trying to have a theme, black, gold, and yellow as well, just to have that potluck. We're gonna eat, listen to music, possibly listen to poetry. We wanna get one of our BSU members to the poem, so. And then potentially watch a movie as well. Or you can go to the next slide, please. This is more information on what we kind of have as our idea for that night as well. We want to get catered from a black owned business. We are trying to strive at the max specifically, but again, we're still working on it because that's a club we want to choose. And it was also kind of requested about getting some African food as well. So again, as a club, we're gonna all decide. We wanted to have it as a theme where it's gonna be black, gold, and white. And we wanted to try to make something a little different by including fancy invitations. And again, we're trying to like strive at building that community with our black families. So we kind of want this night to be 
where us black students at Tualatin and our families come together and celebrate this night of Black History Month. But we are gonna include everyone, of course. So yeah. uh, next slide, please. And this is another agenda for it. And I have our introduction. We thank everyone who's came. We're gonna have music played, everyone eats, and then play a kahoo and have prizes. Then have a group discussion with our parents get some feedback from them as well. And then us talk about Black History Month and what it means to us, and then conclude the event. Next slide, please. And then I also put some more description of like the ideas of what type of music we wanna have there, like jazz music. And then we also have a Kahoot. We're gonna try to have the theme be like, guess the song. And then we're also going to have a Black History Month group based on, you know, certain, I guess, sayings or quotes. <laughs> some of the Black some of the Black Student Union uh, members are going to plan on that. So and then we're going to have our group discussion. Next slide, please. So these are the people we also have reached out to, Renee Watson. We haven't heard back from yet, so I didn't cross that one out. <laughs> Kim Johnson unfortunately said she couldn't, but she said in May, so we might pull that back to May. Adrian Nelson also didn't come back to us about anything. And then the C5 is also we're waiting on that. So yeah. Next slide, please. And the goals of our night is to celebrate African American communities and study its Walletton and to enjoy one another and also have fun. Next slide. And then this is also the things that we're waiting on is the logo. Well, we just got the logo yesterday, so <laughs> that's off the list. And then we're waiting on our speaker, if we can get one, and then the posters that we have ordered so far. And then next slide. That's it. Do you guys have any questions? Well, thank you very much for the presentation, colleagues. Questions? Vice Chair Lynn. Thank you. Thank you for um, all the work um, for uh, putting this program together. It's very comprehensive. Uh, you know, I certainly would be happy to help get the speaker, some of those people I know. Um, so I, if you, I mean, let's talk about speakers and see if we can't partner together to get some good speakers if, if that's an area of challenge. Um, so I, I'd be happy to help with that. Thank you. Director Urban. Yeah, again, that was an amazing presentation and the amount of work and detail uh, that went into that. That's really exciting to see that all that's happening. Um, similar to Director Lynn, um, in terms of food, I might have, um, I know for sure the MAC, um, but some other businesses, um, if that's another challenge, yeah, that's I'd fine. be willing to. Um, Help out with that, and also I'm curious. So for the art that was purchased, right? Mm -hmm. Will that stay in the high school? Is that being auctioned off? Is that so the artwork? Yeah, it's gonna stay in the high school. Nice. Um, we have some in the den as well, <clears throat> uh, but we're gonna have it around the high school. Awesome. We have four pieces so far in the library. Fantastic. Really, really awesome work. My only question is what what kind of response have you seen from students um, at the high school? How are how are students responding? You know, some of the students actually took pictures of the artwork. Um, I haven't gotten any like signs of, I guess, offended offenses or anything. I haven't seen anyone irritated by the artwork or giving bad feedback on it. So I think a lot of students also enjoy it. That's awesome. And be and the other programming too, students attending and I'm here. sorry. And for the other programs, are students attending the things that have happened so far and all of that? Um, yes. Good. Good. Other comments or questions? Okay. Oh, sorry, Director Hannah. It's okay. Uh, no, I was just going to echo the sentiment uh, from the my fellow board members that you know, great job on the presentation. Uh, let us know if there's anything that we can do for you because we'd love to help out and. Uh, Thank you for the uh, invitation because that's really something that uh, I would love to attend. 
So thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Of course. Um, good evening. Um, my name is Raji Tonga. I'm the vice president of the Tiger High BSU. I'm currently filling in for Heaven um, Clark, who unfortunately could not be here today. And I'm just here to share our activities plan for our Black History Month. So for February 12th, we have a Trailblazer event and came at the Motor Center. We're partnering up with BEAM and the Black Educational Achievement Movement. We have, and then we also have Unity Week. For day one, we're gonna be celebrating Black activists. We're gonna be showing appreciation for Black activists and their accomplishments. Um, we're also gonna do, for day two, we're gonna have, we're gonna be celebrating Black culture. Miro, we're gonna have like a Miro. We just got that approved by our principal, I believe. Um, we're gonna have food trucks, because that's um, allowed by the, the um, health department and then, and then we're also going to display the showing of diversity of our culture. We're going to, you know, share any stories or any practices we have or believe in. And then for day three, we're going to be celebrating black music. music. So, um, we're going to have songs during like the passing period where people are like going through the halls. We, um, I think we're going to have a speaker for that for sure. And then we're going to maybe have, have an assembly. We're going to possibly have a pajama jam for a joint pajama jam between the THS and quality BSU students. So that would be fun. And then for day four, we're going to have Black Intelligence Day. We might have speakers during lunches and we're going to make a presentation of Black leaders in America, um, just celebrating their achievements and looking up and talking about them. And then apart from Unity Week, we have on February 23rd, we're going to um, some of the learning students are going to participate in the Tackling Tiger podcast with the City of Tiger. And thank you for listening. That's all I have today. Uh, any questions? Thank you for being here. Uh, this was really exciting to hear about. Um, and again, I, I want to echo uh, Vice Chair Lynn's comment. It sounds like you're doing a lot of, you're not taking this lightly, you're doing a lot of programming with a lot of opportunities for engagement. I think that's really important. Um, so thank you for being leaders in your schools and for taking the time on a Wednesday evening to share with your school board. We really do appreciate hearing from you. Uh, okay, with that, thank you, thank you. And Octavia, for all your support and work with students, we really appreciate that too. So thank you. All right, let's join in a round of applause for our presenters. Yes, uh, so with that, um, we're going to move to uh, action item part one, which is resolution 2122-12, proclaiming February 2022 Black History Month, and I will hand it over to Vice Chair Lynn. Mm -hmm. A resolution of the Tiger Tolleton School District procl proclaiming February 22 Black History Month, resolution 2122-12. Whereas in 1915, Dr. Carter Goodwin Woodson, noted black scholar and son of former slaves, founded the Association of the Study of African-American Life and History and initiated the first celebration of Negro History Week on February 7th, 1926, which led to the annual celebration of Black History Month. And whereas National Black History Month is a national tradition established in response to the inadequate and oftentimes biased depiction of black history and representation of African-American communities and history books and school curriculum. And whereas Black History Month shines an annual spotlight on the powerful and continued fight to authentically honor black Americans for their contributions throughout history. And whereas Tiger Tolleton School District has board policies that guide us in our commitment to bring our students and community together in conversations of race, as well as ensuring accurate black history is represented in American history curriculum at all grade levels as practice. And whereas we pledge to study black history, learn, acknowledge and disrupt the systems built to hold back our black citizens and especially our black students every day. And whereas the district is working towards eliminating the racial predictability and disproportionality on all aspects of education 
And whereas the district collaborates and partners with community-based organizations to further its efforts of forming strong relationships in a culturally appropriate way and to provide feedback and guidance to district leaders on improving outcomes and providing opportunities for Black Americans, first and second generation African and multiracial youth in our district. And whereas the study of African-American life and history has dedicated Black History Month 2022 to, to honoring Black health and wellness. And whereas we honor the contributions of Black health workers throughout history and those who have tirelessly served as frontline workers during the pandemic. And now, therefore, we, the Tiger Carlton School Board, do hereby proclaim February 1st through February 28th, 2022, to be Black History Month as the, in the Tiger Carlton School District. Be it further resolved that Tiger Carlton School District Board of Directors strongly encourages our staff and community to observe, recognize, participate in, and celebrate the culture, heritage, contributions, and events of Black Americans in our country, our state, our cities, and our schools. All right. Thank you, Vice Chair Lynn. Uh, very well-written resolution, so thank you for that. Um, is there a motion to adopt the resolution? Okay. Um, I move this. I move to adopt resolution 2122 12, proclaiming February uh, 2022 Black History Month as presented. Motion. I, Go ahead. I second. Motions are made by Director Hyman and seconded by Director Irvin. Is there any discussion on the motion? All right, we'll move to a choral vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Lynn, and thank you, students. Do we are we going to do a picture? Or are we going to? Tracy, we'll be doing a foot scene. Do we do a? Are we doing a photo, a photo or? Absolutely. <laughs> Don't put the painting away. So yeah, students, we'd invite you to join us at the front, Thanks. and we'll take a quick break for a photo. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you, you just come, stand right there. You right awkwardly there. stand in the middle. <laughs> yes, you are. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't worry. worry. No, no, no. Stand. <laughs> Do you guys are you saying like a choir? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all very much. All right. With that, we have finished uh, action item part one, and we will move into student representative reports. Uh, Mahathi, unfortunately, has uh, an important test this week, so she is at home studying, which the board fully supports, I should know. Um, <laughs> but Henry, that leaves you to, uh, to give us a student representative report. So what's going on at Tiger High School? Um, well, since Mahathi's not here, you get the one-sided version of the Tiger versus Walton swim meet, um, <laughs> where the girls won by one point. The end score was 85 to 84. Wow. Um, it was kind of crazy. It was completely packed. It was really awesome to be there. The energy was really crazy. The boys did lose, um, and because she's not here, I will not say the score. Um, <clears throat> the semester is also <laughs> over. Um, it's been relieving, uh, but also not at the same time. Um, it's the workload has stayed um, what it was pre finals week, um, but that stress has been relieved for the most part. And that's been a universal thing throughout the school. It's nice to not walk around in such an intense atmosphere um, for a week. Um, the new attendance and hall pass rules have also been interesting. At Tigard, um, our, one of our security um, personnel does stand at the door and checks to see stickers. And that has been a change for a lot of students um, having to get Excuse lunch me, stickers. Could the audience not be speaking when our student representative is giving a report? 
Excuse me. Please don't speak while our student representative is giving their report. Thank you. Sorry about that, Henry. Um, yeah, so the security personnel stands at the door, and that's been interesting for students having to get um, lunch release stickers, and now that's been a lot um, more universal. There's been quite a few students who have to go get stickers now, and that's been documented much better. Um, we're starting our club fair planning. So like with the club rush at the beginning of the year, which is where we have all of our clubs kind of make their own tables and have their boards and present what their clubs are about. And um, given that students from online are now returning back to in-person, uh, ASB and ICC, which is the inner club council have decided to do a club fair so that those students will get um, introduced to all the activities that we have tired and also get to do some extra recruiting for those clubs. Um, that should happen at the end of February, early March. Um, and then talking about clubs, uh, Sparrow Club has just started with um, our new uh, Sparrow. Um, and there's been volunteering and there's lots of donations that are going on. Uh, there's a donation contest right now, actually, um, where every $100, there'll be a new event that happens. Like um, for $100, when they raise that, um, my psychology teacher will do a TikTok dance um, <laughs> all the way up to 500, where we make Mr. Uh, Bailey into an ice cream sundae. So I, I would like to see Mr. Bailey as a sundae, so I would recommend that everybody donates. Um, <laughs> We're also celebrating National Counseling Week. Um, so thank you to all of our counselors uh, for everything that they do. Um, and then pretty much just to wrap it up, it's been really just a period of relief and kind of transitioning to semester two. Um, it's nice to see students back um, and finally be done with finals week. Awesome. That was very good to hear. Any questions for the student representative? I have one. Yes, Director. So Christine. if you do uh, raise the $500 and Principal Bailey is going to be made into an ice cream sundae. Would you please notify the board so that we can <laughs> yes. have watch? Oh, yes. I will make sure to notify the board. And uh, I will also take a video. Just Perfect. Thank awesome. you very much. That is great. Too much. All right. We will, uh, that will wrap our student representative reports and we'll move into superintendent and board communication, Dr. Ricky Smith. Thank you so much, Chair. This evening, I have quite a bit of good news to share. So first, uh, the winter iReady K-8 reading and math assessment data has been collected, and teachers and school administrators are in the process of an academic growth analysis by grade level and subject. Early analysis is showing that growth is present in all student populations. A full report regarding the iReady data, as well as a detailed 2021 graduation and current course completion towards graduation report will be provided to the board at the February 28th meeting. Next, Community Relations Director uh, Rose and I had the pleasure of meeting with the Tiger Tualatin Student Union Climate Change Committee last week. The committee includes Tualatin Juniors Claire Roach, Maddie McClung, Izzy Nisha, and Tualatin Senior Ale, Ale Gutierrez de Nova. They share their advocacy work directed related to this district, state, and federal mitigation of the impacts of climate change and proposed resolution that will be brought to this board for discussion and consideration at the March 14th meeting. Director Rose is connecting these students currently with district leadership to gather information and prepare preparation for the report to the board. On Monday, February 14th, Congresswoman Bonamici will be meeting with Tigard High School teacher Laura Kelly's government class from 12 to 1 p.m. at the representative's request for a student roundtable. I know our students will have an amazing experience and I'm grateful to the representative for providing this opportunity to our students. Regarding gratitude, I wish to express the district's gratitude to our school counselors in celebration of school counselor work week, February 7th through the 11th. Our counselors are foundational to student mental health and academic counseling services and have been and are an integral part of addressing COVID trauma this year. Today, the state legislature received the quarterly revenue forecast, which was stunning. Net general fund and lottery revenues are up a combined 1.173 billion since the December forecast, a robust growth of 4% in just three months. And since that previous forecast, projected personal kicker has almost doubled to 964.2 million, and the projected corporate kicker has grown by over 150% to 633.8 million. We are only one third of the way through the year and the state expects those numbers to grow significantly in future forecasts. The state reserve accounts, the education stability fund, the rainy day fund and cash reserves grew significantly again. 
and are currently projected to top 5 billion during the 21-23 biennium. This is equivalent to 20% of the general fund budget. Add in the strength of corporate activity tax collections, and it's safe to say that Oregon's budget is the best financial position since the passage of Measure 5 in 1990. Finally, a brief touch on the Oregon Health Authority news on Monday, giving districts control of COVID mitigation that ensures in-person instruction beginning March 31st. District staff have begun work on the development of a district COVID mitigation plan that is anchored in choice regarding the use of masks. With a full report for the board's consideration at the March 14th meeting in preparation for the March 31st transition. The past two days, we have fielded emails from across the district, those advocating for medically fragile and immune compromised students, to students who cannot be vaccinated due to medical conditions, to those advocating for no masks, regardless of circumstance. Director Rose and the communication team is developing a student, staff, and parent survey that will be sent out from each school, supported by the school's family partnership advocate, to ensure that all students and families have support to respond to the survey the week of February 18th. We will be looking for our student board reps, Henry and Mahathi, to assist us in getting the word out about the survey to students as well. Survey data will be one of several data points that will help us develop a plan that balances the needs across student, staff, and parent stakeholders. We will continue to provide updates regarding the progress of this plan towards the March 14th report in the weekly Friday newsletters and the two minutes with Dr. Sue videos. Thank you. All right, that is some wonderful news in there. Uh, questions for Dr. Ricky Smith? I do have a couple. Yes. Um, so, and you might not have these data points offhand. So, and perhaps Director Moore might, uh, might know from OASBO or something. With the increased revenue projections, are we expecting full funding level of the original prediction for Student Success Act? I would imagine with those numbers going up that we would be up to at least yeah. that level. Okay. So that would basically mean an additional 10 million for TTSD. Well, not an additional. No, we get us to the 10 million. 10 yeah, million. correct. Fantastic. Um, and the corporate kicker, I believe, is now allocated exclusively to K-12 rainy day, right? That's correct. So the... That's wonderful news because what it means is when we do hit another economic recession, we're going to have probably the highest level of research we've ever had in Oregon to right. weather the storm. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, sorry for monopolizing there. Any questions? Okay. With that, we will move on to uh, board uh, communication, board members, any reports? Director Hines. Um, I was invited to attend our Latino Parent Affinity Group for Tiger High School, and it was, uh, you know, pretty refreshing to be there. And uh, they had some good questions, uh, you know, just basics of um, are are the bathrooms open now? <laughs> you know, <laughs> those those kind of things that we discussed before. And so it was it was great to be there and be able to um, listen to what to what they had to say. And then I'm excited to see everybody in the crowd here. Former, uh, well, Bridgeport for me and uh, Bridgeport for them. They're probably not former yet, but there's still some that are parents there. So nice to see you all here. Other reports? Um, I just had one thing, and that is um, when I saw the agenda item about the Northwest Regional ESD, it reminded me that I don't think I ever told you guys that I am now um, on the budget committee for the Northwest Regional ESP. No kidding. So, yeah. Congratulations. So we'll uh, keep them in line. I was going to say the Maureen Wolf, Jill Zershmi duo. You know, I, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't keep away from it. <laughs> right? Well, yes. thank you for your service in that role. That's an important role. Vice Chair Lynn. Yes, so um, I've been engaged in a few meetings and conversations. Just want to give a quick update. Um, Jill and I, the director Zershmi and I, um, have had the opportunity to meet with our student board reps uh, uh, on a couple of occasions to do some strategizing about uh, problem solving and addressing issues that continue to be kind of um, challenges for, for students in our district. And so we are, um, I think, really working steadily to 
develop some plans together for um, really, I think, addressing those, those longstanding challenges. So I'm excited about that. Um, at some point, we'll probably give an update or a report to kind of say where, where things are, are going, but we're still in, in, in the process now doing that work. Um, I had a chance to meet, I think yesterday with the um, Educational Excellence Advisory Team for the district. And the purpose of that team is to discuss and communicate around practices and systems implemented in our district uh, that really impact students who are either identified or not yet identified as gifted. Um, and so the discussion last night was around math um, and the sort of math pathway uh, for the district. And there are some state um, policy changes that are looming that are gonna impact our ability to be able to, to make some of the shifts, but I was excited to see uh, district leadership in conversation with parents uh, about the math pathways and about how we can best ensure that all students have access to high quality engaging curriculum in our district. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is uh, we had a very long uh, legislative policy committee meeting on Saturday. <laughs> so, uh, but the legislative policy committee is uh, the Oregon School Boards Association's um, kind of uh, advocacy group around state policy, uh, education policy. So, uh, and, and we are all elected uh, by our region. So uh, I, I, along with, I think, two other people, right, represent Washington County. Uh, and so we had a chance to learn about the committee and, and what the role is of the committee. Um, and also talked about the, the legislative priorities for the Oregon School Board Association, which include the promotion of adequate and stable funding, protecting the Student Success Act, um, supporting local control, um, and in addressing workforce shortages. So there are other things. The other thing I'll mention that the Legislative Policy Committee had uh, some discussion about was the, the uh, SB 1521, which is not yet law, correct? Correct. It's, it's under consideration. And SB 1521, if, yes. if it passes and, and it's, uh, it becomes law, will prohibit school boards from instructing a superintendent to ignore or violate state law or federal law. It will also protect a superintendent from being terminated or disciplined um, for following the law. And it'll require a mutual agreement before any kind of no cause termination to a contract can be added to a, a contract uh, for the superintendent. So it'll put in some protections for superintendents uh, and some accountability uh, for boards, particularly when uh, boards act outside of the law. Um, and so this is, uh, I think folks are feeling pretty good about this um, and there seem to be broad support for it, but that's that's it for me. Director Irvin? Just one quick note, the K6 or K6, 612 Health Curriculum and Adoption Committee is continuing to meet and we are in the process of evaluating um, potential curricula and um, we developed an evaluating and scoring scale for that. So we are sort of midway through that process and we'll continue to be updating as we make decisions. Um, if, to, oh, if, if I can, I have a, a question on something that Director Lynn was talking about with the LPC. Um, so is, does that, are you saying that OSBA is going to be pushing um, for the, the financial stability? Are they talking about pushing for full QEM or are they pushing beyond that? Do you well, know yet? Probably, probably didn't use that level. That <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And we didn't get into a lot of details around what the specific areas mean, but it, you know, essentially our job is to say fund us adequately, right? right. So, that, so that we can operate efficiently, right? So that we don't have to allow people to take calls or something, you know, right. our, our shops. Um, I was just thinking that with what Superintendent Ricky Smith was talking about with the, the increased um, financial outlook, that this is definitely our year to for OSBA to push for full QEM mm -hmm. funding. Is that we're never going to get a, a chance as good as this one to get there. I was going to say, I think we're 93 percent. We're 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 kind of darn close, and if we can get it close, get the football to that line and then hold it there, that That's would be a high. huge, yeah. huge victory for education. Um, a couple notes for me. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that legislation. I know Dr. Ricky Smith was able to testify in support of it. Um, so hopeful that that bill advances. Um, I also know that there's some other bills. 
that mm -hmm. might be very helpful or relevant for our community, including the child care infrastructure bill. Um, so we obviously won't know what will happen for a few more weeks, but that's something for us to be keeping an eye on. Um, I wanted to highlight for folks, because it wasn't at our normal meeting time, there was a joint meeting of the tiger Tolton School District, the city of Tigard, and the city of Tualatin. Um, and I want to just commend our district staff who were working on that um, field proposal, um, shared facilities proposal, because I think I've just been reflecting on it. And I think like we, we've heard frequently from community members about field use and the challenges and the different systems. And I just really appreciate you all coming together. And um, I know we've still got a long ways to go, but um, I think that would just be such a big win for the kids of our community and the youth sports um, uh, without being a loss for us in any way. And in fact, probably being an advantage. So grateful for that work that you're doing. And then finally, just a quick note, we, as Dr. Ricky Smith has um, mentioned, we did receive a lot of feedback over the last couple of weeks. And frankly, over the last couple of years from what uh, former board chair Wolf has said was like the highest level of public input she's ever received on a school board. And I wanted to just thank the folks. I would say about 99% of what we've received has been kind and respectful, empathetic, um, but firm. Uh, and there are some folks who are outside those bounds and that's their prerogative. Um, but I, I just appreciate the way in which our community is trying to handle a challenging situation um, with good faith uh, and in, in, in with a sense of community. So I wanted to make that note of appreciation for the folks who are operating in good faith. Any final questions or comments on board reports? Yes, Vice Chair. I forgot to mention that I did attend um, a listening I'm sorry, I did attend a listening session for Black families in the same way that David did and uh, got a chance to hear directly from parents uh, and members of the community about the needs of Black students in our district and um, and, and lots of thoughts and reflections. I think uh, superintendent, they're interested in um, conversation about gaps, right? Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and how we understand what those are and what and how the data sort of reflects um, not only uh, gaps uh, around graduation, but also gaps in achievement in, in specific areas and so on. Um, and there, there definitely was some talk about the experiences of students in schools, experiences with uh, uh, microaggressions and hate speech and so on, discipline issues. Um, and then I had a chance to also be in conversation with people from the Department of Justice through a meeting through a group called Respond to Racism um, the next, next couple of days. And uh, the Department of Justice has a very uh, sort of broad and expansive approach to looking at and capturing data around hate speech and bias. Um, and it doesn't seem like there's a lot of collaboration between the school districts and the Department of Justice. And I think there's a lot of opportunity there for us to work together since they're essentially doing the work that we're trying to do in the schools. So I talked a little bit about the each plan and what we're trying to do at the school level. And I think there are opportunities for collaboration, but I think it will help uh, some of our families with some of their ongoing concerns. All right. Okay, then that will, we will close superintendent and board communication and we will move on to public comment um, just about agenda items. So uh, let me pull up my document. Um, no, I think, we're, I think we're fine. Okay. The Tiger Told School Board meetings are public meetings. That means that the business of the board is conducted in an open meeting for the public to observe as required by law. However, regular public comment at board meetings is a policy choice of the school board, not a legal requirement. As the board values input from our students, parents, and district community members that we serve, the board provides these opportunities for community members to provide input on important topics. In addition to public comment, community members may submit written comments to the board secretary at each meeting or email comments directly to the board. The email addresses of the board uh, can be found on the school district website. This section of public comment is for items directly related to the board meeting agenda. Public comment regarding non-agenda items will be, uh, will be held later in the meeting after our action items. Public comment rules are set by policy and they are limited to three minutes each and should be brief and concise as directed in policy. Speakers may offer objective criticism of district operations or programs, but the board will not hear complaints concerning specific district personnel. There's a specific process and policy for that. We are also unable to hear praise or commendations about district personnel, but invite you to submit commendations to our superintendent, Dr. Ricky Smith. If this public comment agenda, uh, this shouldn't be a problem because we only have one person signed up, um, but we do have a 30 minute cap for each public uh, comment section. 
So a few ground rules. One, please share your zip code prior to you beginning speaking. Please wear your mask when you speak and speak directly into uh, the microphone. As long as the light is green, you can just speak at a normal distance. Director Zershmeed will be timing. She's got cards that you can mm -hmm. use to determine how much time you have left. She's got a one minute card and a stop card. Um, she's also gonna be timing on her phone. When you hear her alarm, that will mean your time is up. You can finish your sentence, but your time is up, so you'll need to wrap and move on. If you would like your public comment reflected in the <coughs> minutes, please provide a written copy to our board secretary, Patty Roberts, at the end of the table. And please know that this is an opportunity for the board to listen to the community. This is not an opportunity for dialogue. The board chair has the ability to respond in, uh, uh, at their discretion, but I generally try not to. Um, that being said, we can follow up if there are specific requests or comments. Um, it's usually helpful to submit them in writing via email. Uh, and all additional comments can be submitted to the school board via email. Okay, so with that, we are going to move on to our uh, our present our uh, public commenter, uh, Janet Bailey. You can come forward. Janet, you'll have three minutes. And uh, it says here that your topic is Black History Month. So I wanna remind you, you've got to speak about Black History Month. And if you veer off of that topic, I'm going to gavel you down and you won't be able to speak on it. Okay. So your time will begin uh, once you begin speaking. So take your time. So I'm looking at page 12 of your 107 packet uh, under Black Student, um, Black Student Union. And it says that Tualatin, Tiger Tualatin High School Black Student Union students are uh, to coordinate activities for Unity Week and celebrate Black History Month. The next bullet point is that Tiger Tualatin School students, Black school students, um, will be attending a Black History Month celebration with the Portland Trailblazers at Moda Center. Tiger Tualatin BSU Black Student Union will partner with Black Educational Achievement Movement to develop leadership, opportun leadership opportunities for Black students. The City of, the City of Tiger will partner with Tiger Tualatin High School Black students to share their voice in a city podcast. Tiger High School will host virtual, a virtual meeting for Black families. So as I look at this, I'm thinking, when is Latino History Week? When is White History Week? When is Jewish History Month? Is this a new trend for all races in this school district to expect? Can we expect that uh, during the Latino month, Latino kids will get um, special activities with the exclusion of those kids with black skin? This is blatantly racism. You're telling white kids that they're not good enough. This is a form of hate speech. So black kids are going to enjoy a privilege that, what, that kids with white skin or Latino skin or Asian skin color don't get to participate in. Is this a privilege that only kids with black skin get to enjoy while the other kids don't make the cut because of the color of their skin? What about kids that have a white mom and a black dad? Do they get excluded to stay home because their mom is white or their grandparents have white skin? These are questions that I have and others do too. Well, so if there's a podcast, will there be a podcast for white families? How about Latino families? How about Asian or Jewish families? Let's be fair to everyone and not show racism. Thank you. All right, with that, we will wrap the uh, public comment portion uh, of the agenda. Sorry, sir, you're out of order. The public comment, you're signed up for the public comment that is not related to an agenda item. Yeah. Sir, sir, sorry, I'm sorry. We're not gonna engage in the dialogue. We have your submission. You're signed up for a non-agenda item. If that's a problem, you can email with the board secretary to get it straightened out but you're not scheduled for an agenda item. We're not gonna discuss it. I'm sorry, sir. You're... 
You're out of order. No, you may not. We have, sir, there are six people signed up for public comment. You are not going to cut in front of them just because you want to. That's not appropriate. So with that, we're going to close public comment. You can send us in. All right, this meeting is going to be in recess. Please cut the public meeting. We're going to wait until the disruption is done. You people are weak and are going to get involved. Okay, board members, board members. All guests get involved. Put you on notice right now.
Is it broadcast live? Are we live? All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, sorry for the disruption. Uh, we are ready to resume our meeting. I want to thank our operations staff and the City of Tigard Police Department for their support in ensuring that we can conduct our business as a school board. Um, so with that, uh, we will have our public comment, our regularly scheduled public comment for non-agenda items after our action items. That is when it is always held in our agenda. We have some folks signed up for that and they will be afforded the right to comment uh, just as everyone else is and we'll follow the same rules for everybody. I want to make that very clear. Um, okay. So with that, we are going to move on to report and discussion items, and we will start with our first report and discussion item, Strategic Planning Community Engagement Plan Report, uh, with presenter Dr. Sue Ricky smith Thank you, Chair. I think in light of uh, the fact that we did have a board work session, I thought it was still, would still be important if uh, Director Rose shared the community engagement process as we are now live for the entire community, um, and we believe in transparency of process. Uh, and so uh, she will share just a few highlights from our work session um, and the plans going forward relative to engaging the various stakeholder groups. Director Rose. Thank you, Dr. Sue. Chair Bowman, directors, we met earlier this evening uh, to go through a very uh, inclusive community engagement process as we head into the new strategic plan planning. Uh, we will begin in early March. Uh, we will hold three, uh, committee, executive oversight committee meetings that will guide our process. The board will be working uh, in partnership with our consultant, Point North, to set the tone for our planning and to be able to go through the data and to plan as we head into the deep uh, discussions that we'll be having. We'll have three broad community listening sessions, and then we will be doing weekly meetings with stakeholders. We look to have this process wrapped up by uh, mid-April so that we can merge the two processes with our community budget conversations and planning. We will then uh, continue on gathering data, putting things together, refining the plan throughout the first couple months of the summer, and then reconvene in August to review where we are, review what we've learned, and to start um, putting our plan together so that we can release it at the beginning of September. Okay. Any questions or comments? All right. Oh yeah, by Sharon. I just want to offer our thanks to um, Director Rose and Director Hunt um, for uh, their work in organizing um, these sessions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you. Okay. okay. Well, with that, then we will move on to our second uh, report and discussion item, the first reading of 2022-2023 open enrollment in district and inter-district transfers. Uh, Director Rose, you're up again. Yeah, thank you. We have a, a presentation <laughs> Patty's going to help us with. Yeah, there it is. Um, I am joined here with Coco Flores. As you know, Kathy Longfellow retired in June. She had managed our district transfer process for a very long time. She was instrumental in teaching me, along with Susan Stark Caden, as a, the new kid in town, learning district, the, all of the ins and outs of the district transfer process. And Coco was able to join us um, in July. We are thrilled to have her. We're she um, is now getting her first taste of a board meeting this evening. And, um, <laughs> and I'm very happy to be able to work in partnership with her. And I have just been um, so pleased. Uh, she has dug deep into our process. She has quickly uh, introduced herself to our neighboring districts, to the ODE. She has picked up the phone and called superintendents. She has picked up the phone and called OSAA. She has um, really informed our process. And I'm looking forward to as we are moving out of COVID and really getting intentional about how we move students within our district and in and out of our district, um, just getting a really clean uh, process in place. Tonight's goals are really to give you a high level overview for those of you that aren't as familiar with the processes that we have in place. You have in your board packet reports and, and data and information that I'm sure that we would be happy to talk, uh, answer any questions you might have, but to get us started tonight, we are going to give you an overview of the process. We're gonna review what this year has looked like compared to the last two years. 
and uh, have a conversation around considerations for the upcoming year and how that transfer process will look. There are two, um, two main processes of transfer. One is the resident students um, moving within our district from school to school. And then there is the former HB 2747, which put rules in place that help us transfer students in and out of our district. Uh, the other important piece here for us that we can take a look at is that we are held to a 3% rule that once we hit 3% students leaving the district, then ODE will come in and we will um, be, we, we need to decline anything past that. We have, we are, as you saw in the report, about 2.5% right now. Um, we thought we would be higher, uh, but that is, uh, we're staying steady at about 2.5%. And uh, we haven't got to the point yet where we have seen students um, leaving at, at that large of a rate to where we would have to have OD put us on hold. So I'm gonna turn it over to Coco to talk about the in-district and out-district process. Good evening, everyone. This is our in-district transfer process. I think we need the next slide. Oh, sorry, we're a couple slides ahead. There we go, thank you. So our in-district transfer process is pretty much a family submits an online application. The principals review and make recommendations. And if the student is approved, they may attend the selected school through the highest grade level, fifth elementary and eighth for middle school. And the application must be submitted to enter into the next level of school, whether it's into the middle school or high school, if they choose to stay within the feeder pattern of the selected school. Next slide. And then the inter-district transfer process is for students that are out of our district or in our district that would like to attend school in another district. And this process is approved by the board each year. A family submits an application online. The first 20 applicants to attend TTSD and the first 20 to request a release are approved. And once those spots are filled, we turn over to hardship approvals only once all the 20 in and 20 out spots are filled. And once a student is admitted to TTSD or approved for release, the student is able to remain at the selected district through their 12th grade school year. All right, so just a brief overview of both of these processes uh, so far to date this year. For the in-district transfers, we have done a total of 768 transfers, 396 at the elementary level, 101 at the middle school level, 271 at the high school level, and 159 at Creek, Creekside. Those numbers um, also include previous. So it's, and it's an accumulative number of not only what has happened this year, but what in total, how many students in total have received transfers at each of those levels. That's why those numbers are high. And in the, in the report, if you look at the report, you can see what is this year and then what is continuing. So just want to clarify. So yes. every student at Creekside would be considered a, a transfer student to yes. Creekside. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. In our, in our district, so in our district and out of our district, incoming students, a total of 90 for this year, are, are a total of 90 incoming students. Of those, 54 of them are continuing students and their siblings, 36 new students, and 16 of that 36 are hardships. For those students that were released, we had a, a total of 74 for this school year, 35 are continuing students and their siblings, 39 were new students, and of those 19 were hardship approved. So we are here today to talk to you all about options for the process for next year. Um, and as we are talking about it, a few things just of note. Um, and next slide, please, Patty. So there are some considerations. Uh, our current process is a first come first serve process. 20 spots are open for incoming into our district. 20 spots are open to re be released from our district. Spots typically fill up rather quickly when we uh, announce the date of which we'll start taking applications. 
um, we start getting those applications first thing in the morning. Once we fill those spots, then we transition to hardship only. And again, um, the spots fill up pretty quickly. So we find ourselves in, January, uh, in July, pretty much through June, only considering hardships. The, there are clear barriers with this process um, that we have identified uh, in previous years. And that is if someone has access to a computer and is able to fill out the form and to get their application in, then they will be able to uh, claim one of those spots. We have had a lot of conversation around how we can make that process a little bit more equitable. Another uh, influencer is enrollment, current versus historical, as you'll see, in the um, and if you could reference the report that I provided relative to the district comparables, we've seen that our neighboring districts have changed their processes this year, and we believe that there is a huge influence relative to students, um, the student enrollment, and the the fact that we have lost students. Therefore, I think districts are are loosening up the criteria as to qualifications for this process, and then the timeline. The timeline for in-district uh, will start March 1st. This is a critical um, forecasting time for, uh, we just started our kinder roundups and in fact, uh, Principal Swindle at Metzger just sent me a picture of their kindergarten roundup. So we are getting ready to onboard some new, uh, new class of kindergartners. Uh, we have fifth graders that are moving into sixth grade. So if we have a fifth grader that has is on a transfer process and a feeder pattern that they want to continue in, then we need to make sure that they get in and they get transferred to that school. So they stay on the current feeder pattern that they're in. So for in districts, we will be setting that date as March 1st. For the intra-district transfers, we are looking at a mid-May date. And then um, that's where we would like to have a conversation with you all about the considerations for what our process could look like for next year. Here are the, um, the options, uh, as we've stated, you know that what we're currently doing is 20 in, 20 out hardships after that only. Um, these are the other processes that you will see on those comparable lists. Um, lottery, so uh, how, how you would institute a lottery system to make it more equitable for folks, uh, for families that are looking to get in or to be released from our, from our district. Um, hardships only, if you see on the comparables list, I believe Beaverton is the only one that is fully doing um, hardships at this time. Portland Public had been only doing uh, hardships, but as you can see with some of those school districts now, they're everywhere from 50 to 100 uh, or unlimited transfers, which is interesting. So the other options are unlimited number with a deadline, which would be say we open up on June 1st and we continue to take in and, in and out applications for transfer between June 1st and September 1st for uh, six weeks, or we have unlimited spots, which I, I'm sure Director Moore and Dr. Sue would not be thrilled about. Uh, and that's from, from one from all. The other considerations and, and uh, coming into this conversation, I was very intrigued and had asked uh, Coco to look into what a, a lottery system would look like. Um, hardship only for us would be constant administrative work. Um, hardships have to be reviewed by the principals. Hardships need to be proven that they're hardships. Letters need to be submitted, custody letters, medical letters. Um, so what we're looking at, and if you look at the data that we provided to you, we have, um, we have 39, 37 and 39, 37 that have come in or have left and 39 that have come in. We feel that this is an opportunity to raise that number. Um, looking at the comparables again, you can see that districts now have said, we'll take a certain number, like hundred students can come in. 50 students can go out, so the numbers aren't even the same. So these that's the question we're hoping that we can get direction from you on this evening on how you all are feeling about this process. And then we'll go back and dig a little deeper and come back for the next meeting to propose um, the plan for 22-23. 
turn it over to you for discussion. Questions or comments? <laughs> I have some comments, but I want to make sure that my fellow board members have a chance yeah. to ask questions. Lead us off, yeah. I've been through this rodeo a couple of times. Um, I, I love the idea of increasing the number of automatics because I know the, the hardship case administration load is huge. And if we know that we can increase that number of, of automatics to say 50 in, 50 out and cover almost always all of the people who want in and out, that seems like a really um, sensible way to go. I'm a little dismayed that some of my neighboring districts where they have will release significantly fewer kids than we'll take in. Or, or, sorry, we'll release fewer than we'll take in. Um, it seems like if you're gonna release somebody, you should take somebody in at an equal level. So I think say 50 in, 50 out is a really reasonable um, level. I also wanted to say this uh, in-district transfer for parents guide that you put together is just beautiful. It's, it's so nice for a parent to be able to go to the website and say, I fall into this category, what do I do? Uh, instead of having to um, sort of guess, right? It's, it's just really nice, really clear. I love it. And I'm sure our parents who use it will, will agree. So thank you for all the work you did on that. Um, I don't know how my fellow board members feel about increasing the the number and going to automatic rather than hardships, but it seems like a no-brainer to me. Questions, comments? Um, so, if if a if a parent requests a transfer out of the district and it's not approved, um, they can still go to the other district, but they pay tuition. Is that what happens? Yes. Okay. Yes, that is the other option. Yes. So I just want to confirm what um, Director Zershmi is saying. You're, you're saying we increase the number, and you're saying, did you say you want to eliminate hardships? Yeah. So currently we have 20 in, 20 out, and then hardships after that. And so um, I would say for the first year, we could just do, let's say, 50 in, 50 out, because right now 50 would have covered all of our automatics and all of our hardships so, without, without all of that administrative right. work. And if it turns out that by raising it to 50, suddenly we've got a huge influx of people wanting in and out, then maybe we need to readdress we need to do hardships. But it seems like that that would cover the people who wanna come in or leave the district pretty pretty easily. I see what you're um, the, the idea of going to a lottery is an interesting one. Um, you know, you have, a window of say six weeks where people can put their names in. And then at the end of that six weeks, you take however many people have signed up. And if it's more than the numbers of spots we've allotted, then we do draw a lottery for which, which kids get to transfer and which ones don't. Um, that helps with the equity problem because um, if we have a small number of, of, of spots, then you know it's gonna be the parents who are sitting in front of their computer on the day that transfers open, who will be clicking and getting one of those 20 spots. And it might be that a family who doesn't have access to a computer or doesn't know to be sitting in front of the computer at 8 a.m. on X day, that they then get shut out of the process. The problem with the lottery from a parent's perspective is I put my name in for my kid on say March 5th and the window ends April 15th. Um, and then I don't know for six weeks whether my kid is going to be going to this school or that school. Do I have to come up with an alternate plan? And so that's why the automatic is kind of nice because if you're one of those first 50, you're in. You, you get whichever way around you want it. So it's, it's easier for all parties that way. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if it's subject to abuse, then I think we should reevaluate it. But Can you explain a little bit more about how the hardships work, what that process looks like, and what sort of circumstances are common? For hardship. Absolutely. So for hardships, you have to have a, if it's a medical need, you have to have a documented medical issue. Um, it's 
is it's bullying is another kind of really hard for a hard kid, but it also has to be documented. So even if your son is son or daughter is um, experiencing bullying but hasn't reported it, it wouldn't be considered a hardship because we need documentation behind that. And then the other one is a financial financial hardship. I see. So I guess what I would say is I um, I, I kind of tend to want to defer to staff on, on what you think is best here. But what I would say is um, I'm okay with increasing the cap, but would like to preserve the hardship option just because I would hate to reach the cap, have a student in a really tough spot and not be able to accommodate that student's needs. Um, so that's my perspective. Dr. Irvin? Would there be a way to, on the application, now, you would still ultimately maybe have to administratively look at some of them, but still have them mark. I'm transferring because of hardship. And of those 50 that we take, or is this sort of weirdly unethical, but sort of like make sure all of the hardships are taken in some ways first out of those 50. And then you know, because they're hardships, then they probably would have been transferred anyway. And then we see how many additional transfers there are um, and balance them that way. But at least the, the first chunk of those, you wouldn't have to, I mean, if we're still under the number, you wouldn't have to check the hardship status. But we'd also know to, to Chair President <laughs> Ben, um, it's been a crazy evening, um, to his point, to make sure that all of our students that had the hardships were for sure in that bucket. So a way to kind of know in that first 50, this many are hardships, we don't have to worry about those. If we have 20 additional, get those first, you know, 10, no, I can't even do the math, 10 in that would cover that 50 and then look at that overflow and then either bring those in and administratively backlog 10, does that make sense? Like 10 of the hardships to kind of bring it around. But knowing that in some way, shape, or form, we get all those hardships covered, I guess. Is the, the beauty of the in-district process is that principals of this program would work very closely with their referral if there was a request for a transfer between the two schools. There's a very high, fair, and handoff. They agree that it's the best, best option opportunity for the student. When they're coming in for a district or leaving that district, it's a little bit harder to do. Um, especially those that are coming in. Um, I would say that you know, 50, I, I feel 50 is a number of that, would, um, that we may get to, we may not. And um, anything after that would be hardship. Hardships are going to come up throughout the year. Um, whether we fill this bar or not, we're going to know that we're getting uh, a request. Um, yeah, we've gotten just two requests this week relative to yeah, and, and their hardships relative to a uh, child having to live with another family because of some type of medical emergency in their home or not state or wherever it might be. So there we're, we do need to respond to those and we will continue to respond. Isn't there also an issue when we're dealing with interdistrict transfers that we're not allowed to ask anything about the student? Um, what is it? Other than you know their their grade level, we're not even allowed to ask gender. We're certainly not allowed to ask about medical or disability, and so it would be very difficult, I think, to screen out hardship cases out of the initial interdistrict transport pool. Is what I'm getting at, because so we're not allowed. My understanding of the original house bill, where students were able to come in and out of the district, um, we were not. It was it just the first year where we came in. Right. Never for hardships, they do need to the hardships. There, is, there is a viable hardship. The hardships are listed on the website. Um, if you qualify within one of them, then they do also need to do this from the district. Right. Well, we can't blend the two. That's my point. Other questions or comments? Yeah, Vice Chair Lynn. So just to clarify, were, were you proposing that uh, that we not consider hardships if we increase the number to 50? No, I am proposing, I am saying that we will always have hardships. Okay. Um, we oh. will always have hardships. If we have a number of 
say 200 and they never made 200, we're still going to be approving transfers that are considered hardships. But if we have a number of 50, and for whatever reason for next year, we start getting a whole lot of requests and we fill those 50 spots, then we are going to definitely be considering students throughout the rest of the year. For whatever reason, if it's a hardship, it's some type of emergency for that family or that student, and we will definitely consider that. So then in our mind, we're really increasing the kind of like general population transfer number to 50 because we will always look at the hardships regardless of the cap. And what is happening now is once we get to 20, everybody's denied right. unless they can prove hardship. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It didn't, it took about six months for those 20 spots to get filled too. It was. It took about six months for those 20 spots to get filled. Okay. Because our like continuing releases or continuing to attend don't count towards those numbers. This is just strictly brand new students. Okay. And so then administratively to your point, if we open the cap to 50 and whether or not one or 50 of those first 50 that could come in and out were hardship, that wouldn't matter because that would never be affecting our cap. So that would still decrease the administrative load for the hardship transfers because they would just be fine under that 50. And then anything after that, they would have to prove the hardship and we left them in. It would also take the burden off the family. Yeah. Okay. It seems like, particularly in a time of COVID, when, you know, Families need that fluidity more, probably more than ever. This is a really good time to up that number and make it just easier for everybody. You feel like you got what you need from the board? Yes. Okay. Um, we will come back with a proposal to be approved at the next board meeting. Um, and as you're looking at the data, make sure that you know I have included um, 1920 because that's pre COVID. So you'll see the numbers for pre COVID, which is where we, at some point, hopefully we'll be back to, and then mm -hmm. you have the thick of COVID and the average. Yep. Okay, okay. other question, uh, do you have a question? No, oh. I just did. Oh. Cool. Yeah. All, right. All right, thank you, thank you. We thank appreciate you. the presentation. All right, with that, we will close our report and discussion items and we'll move on to action items part two in the agenda. Uh, and we will start off with new course proposals with Director Todd Robson. All right, Board Chair Bowman, members of the board, great to see everybody this evening. Um, we have uh, uh, some presentations this evening, really to highlight the uh, new course proposals that you've got uh, in the board packet. Um, there's a handful, and so um, one of the emphasis is the, and what we're emphasizing this evening are really highlights around that. And as you have questions, that folks can go a little deeper as needed, uh, specific to certain classes that you that we have uh, available uh, on the docket. So with that, I do wanna do, I mean, we have some folks who are gonna be online. Um, I think jumping in here, um, Lisa Daly, uh, Vice Principal from Tigard High School, um, has led this charge uh, on the Tigard side of things and working with teachers. Uh, and so some of those folks are gonna be here this evening to, to be able to share some insight around uh, the courses that are proposed. Andy Van Fleet, principal at Fowler Middle School is here. There is a middle school proposal as you've read um, this year. So I'm excited to have him here. And Taylor Siren, who is a, uh, a staff member there at Fowler is gonna be online, I believe as well. So hopefully that all goes smoothly um, as we make this happen this evening. So with that, we, uh, as, as part of a process, we have a new course proposal process that really is set up to, um, and, and, and as you know, through policy, we bring new courses to the board uh, for um, uh, recognition of the kinds of courses that schools are thinking about adding, and then also for discussion and then um, as an action item uh, for hopefully for approval. Um, but with that, we have a process then to vet new course proposals and timing on that is such that uh, new course proposal 
uh, updates or reminders go out generally uh, in November-ish and with a deadline for uh, a January uh, uh, turn-in date. And that allows for uh, schools to start thinking about next year uh, and what's coming up for them in terms of building out pathways and the kinds of courses that they are hearing about from the student body as well and talking with instructors about what might be um, advantageous to add to their, their, um, their menu of, of options. And so with that, we do a vetting process with a committee. Once those come in, we work with the schools in terms of, of uh, kind of a back and forth in terms of that vetting process to make sure all is uh, in place uh, and uh, partner with them basically in this process. And so uh, that's where we are this evening. We'll come forward to the board then and uh, um, give you an opportunity to ask questions and, and also give these good folks an opportunity to share a little bit, uh, some highlights about the courses. So with that, Lisa, I'll turn it over to you to jump in with the Tiger uh, course proposals in terms of the highlights and we have staff that are going to assist with that. Okay. Thank you so much for having us tonight. Um, I'm really excited that um, I have some of our amazing teachers with us who have really put in so much time and thought behind these proposals. You know, these proposals really come from what they see as need in their classrooms. And um, it's not, it's not an easy process for sure. And so with that, I would like to turn it over to um, first our special education department chair and um, teacher, uh, Christy Goodell, to talk about essential math. Okay, hi there, good evening. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can. Oh. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Great, um, thank you so much for taking time to uh, let us share. Oh gosh, big screen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Sweet. Um, okay. So yes, I am the department chair. I'm a learning specialist in the special education program, uh, the amazing department at Tigard High School. And we offer many classes and interventions. And one of the classes that we offer is consumer math. And that is for students who are working on a modified diploma. And so that is based on a team decision with students on IEPs and their family and their teachers. And um, it's quite a process to determine if a student's gonna work towards modified diploma. And in that regard, you can kind of adjust how a student can participate and earn math credits and develop their math skills. We currently offer consumer math, which is kind of morphed into a very large catch-all for all of our students to earn those math credits. But within that class, um, we have a wide variety of skill. And so for us to effectively differentiate skill kind of becomes quite, uh, quite a task for one teacher to do with within one class. So our proposal is calling it essential skills and it's kind of um, aligning and mirroring what gen ed students would get a sequence of math courses. We are kind of mirroring that within our special education intervention classes. And so essential math, it's kind of a, a spot in between students who are in funk one or funk two, which are um, math programs for our students um, in our high needs program and then between that one and then consumer math. And so it's kind of a nice sequence of events for students to um, throughout their high school career develop and kind of essentially not necessarily be promoted, but like develop skills and then kind of go on to the next level. And will also allow for teachers to kind of have those really purposeful small groups within a class setting and really be able to develop their skills based on their IEP goals and just have it be kind of more meaningful. Students can work on these classes. Um, they need two math credits, but students oftentimes need math developed all four years of their high school career. And what has been happening is that they're just kind of repeating consumer math. And so that second year is not very fun for lack of a better phrase. And so we're trying to eliminate that repetition of being in the same class. And we really wanna have it be a sequence of events and developing their skills. And it's just that continuum of service that we are really trying to promote in a lot of different um, areas for our students. How am I doing? I can keep going. Thank you. I'm good at the talking. <laughs> or do you have any questions for Christy? Or for me? <laughs> okay. 
I don't think so. That was great. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Christy. I know it's late, so I really appreciate you being here. Awesome. No, I'm glad to be here and just kind of share some of the work that our team is doing and how we're kind of promoting success for our students. So glad to be here. Thank you so much for taking time to consider our course. So um, next I'd like to introduce um, Thomas Woodward and he is in our technology department. Hello. Hi there, we can hear you. Excellent, okay, good. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to keep mine uh, as brief as I can. I have quite a few course proposals. I think I have nine in total. So um, the, the basic overview um, is I'm trying to get students more access to dual credit. Uh, in order to do so, I am partnering with PCC and um, trying to coordinate my CAD and engineering um, course load to mirror theirs, uh, which, so for example, they've got an introduction to uh, fusion, they've got uh, intermediate, or sorry, advanced uh, SolidWorks, got advanced inventor. These are all different 3D modeling programs. And um, I've been approved so far to do the 100 level uh, for dual credit. Um, However, I just recently learned that the 200 level, they typically reserve for um, PCC. Uh, so I'm trying to get an exception for one. If I'm able to do all of the uh, SolidWorks courses, I would be able to essentially get my students a PCC uh, recognized certificate, a career pathway certificate with um, only one class that they would have to take after high school. So um, the very high level overview is uh, I'd like so most of my classes to be the 3D modeling. So that is Inventor, that is Fusion 360, and that is SolidWorks. Now, I also have some uh, building classes. That is my digital design and fabrication. That's also offered for dual credit um, in that. I would have the students 3D print. I would have them use the laser cutter. I would have them use the uh, CNC router that I have in my classroom. And this would give them access to a whole bunch of tools. Um, in the past, we've had a class um, that was digital design and fabrication. Uh, and then there was a bunch, there was a two and a three, and I think even a four, um, but they, they weren't really tied to anything. Um, it was just advanced classes, um, but there was no certifications, no credit. So I'm trying to get that tied back into um, some, some college credits so they can uh, essentially double dip for the classes that they're taking. Um, oh, also before I forget, um, my programming classes that I'm uh, proposing, the reason why I'm doing that is because uh, I have found a entire year for the whole um, sequence of classes is a bit much for some students and um, a little tedious for others. There are students who don't need to do the, uh, the first half because they already have programming skills. And there's some that you know ne don't necessarily want to continue to the second half um, after the first semester. So in order to um, give students more freedom, I'd like to take a year long class and split it in half, uh, Python programming one and Python programming two. That is the uh, main goal. I'm also trying to get uh, dual credit established for the 100 level class. That would be Python one, uh, but I have not heard back yet for those approvals. Um, Thank you, Thomas. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have questions for Thomas or myself? <laughs> I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. My sure. husband, who is a software engineer for a 3D printing company in Wilsonville, was ecstatic when I showed him this course list. Oh, great. Uh, so please encourage students to take that Python class in particular, he says. Because Absolutely. He, he needs the employees in a few years. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add it. I, 
have long been a fan of dual credit because it saves our students so much money uh, when they get to the higher education level, not to mention the building blocks you're teaching them that's going to help them excel once they get there. So thanks for the visionary and innovative thinking here, Thomas. Very, very cool. Of course. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Director Jaime. So um, I was just wondering with these classes, um, are we getting other teachers to teach these classes? I mean, I know that it says proposal, but like, so are we building a system of redundancy where it's not just up to one person to teach these classes? Well, I would love to expand our technology uh, department for sure. Right now it is limited to Thomas, but he does have a really close um, colleague who teaches the IT classes. So they collaborate a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as his courses go, unfortunately right now, that's, that's about all that we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong, you know, great, you know, great work on, on the courses. I'm just wondering how can we keep them going in the unfortunate event that um, our friend doesn't, that isn't with us, you Absolutely. know. Absolutely. Yeah, and just to come into the, the, the piece of all this, uh, even in a, in approval, if it was uh, something to, to approve courses, it's still up, up in here, it allows for forecasting but it doesn't guarantee the class will go, um, you know, that year. I think so. It's a, it's a good point. Sustainability over time is definitely another piece of this. Vice Chair Lynn. Yeah, in that same vein, um, when courses are created, are they sort of specific to the school or are they more district wide? How does that work? It's a, actually a combination. Um, we get. Uh, very specific kinds of classes that come out of staff, you know, that dependent on some staff that are available at schools and, and interest and um, from student body interest to staff interest. Uh, so that can vary between schools, but then there also is a part of this process, part of the, the work between, um, you know, us and, and working with uh, Lisa and team and, and Twalton was asking those questions too about um, aligning and, and are there certain courses that are being proposed at one school? Does it make sense to have that same course being offered if it wasn't thought of at the other school as well? So we had those conversations. So it can be, you know, um, kind of both and, you know, in terms of that conversation happening to align between schools, but sometimes it's just specific to the school. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, so I have one more teacher with us, Jamie Swindle. Um, he's going to introduce uh, the third level of our uh, CITC program and a new math course. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for hearing me out. Can you hear me okay? My green light. We can hear you. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so first is the Community Improvement Through Construction uh, Level 3 course, uh, which will be kind of a capstone course for my construction program at Tiger High School. Um, and it's just the next in a sequence. And uh, we're really focusing, hoping to focus on getting our kids out in the community and doing some construction projects that uh, will in some way benefit um, either the, the city of Tiger or um, some sort of a business that serves people that um, need help. And so we're kind of still in the process of figuring out how we can get kids off campus. And, um, and if we can't, that's fine. Um, we have just more advanced residential construction type projects that we're going to focus on in our third year. Um, and then my math class that I'm proposing uh, is kind of a change to the existing geometry by design class. It is taught in the woodshop and it currently serves as a second year math credit uh, for students. It's sort of an alternative to our AGS2 class. And my proposal is to change that from the second year class to a post second year class. Um, and by doing so, I'm hoping to, uh, rather than be given a list of standards that I'm teaching, uh, be able to create a different list of standards that's more centered around teaching math commonly used in the trades. Um, and in, in doing so, it'll allow me to um, dual credit with PCC through with their math class, as well as hopefully the uh, at least the power tools safety class and potentially the intro to construction class that PCC offers. Um, and being a post second year class, I think I'll be able to capture a lot of the kids that um, 
don't typically do well in the math setting. Um, and giving them a hands-on approach. Just, I've seen in my geometry class, a lot of the kids just, you know, we just ended the first semester. And I had kids say, oh my gosh, I've never gotten an A in math. And, uh, and I, I think they still feel like they're doing math. So it's not, it's not like I'm just making this a really easy class because they're just more motivated to get this stuff done. And um, I don't know, and they, they walk out of the class with something at the end of the semester. You know, we built up a birdhouse that they had to design and integrate all the math that we learned for the semester into the design. And then um, upon completion of those things, got to actually build it. And uh, it was, I, I, don't know, I think the kids really enjoyed it. And I enjoy teaching the class and just kind of looking forward to, I don't know, getting in that, that third year type math class. Thank you, Jamie. Are there any questions? Questions, comments? This could be called the uh, uh, career stability path because the trades are <laughs> in such, such high demand. I think it's awesome that you're offering this. I am, I wonder, have you thought about or do you have existing partnerships with um, construction companies or labor unions or folks who can build that partnership to an apprenticeship at some point down the road. Yeah. Have you considered that or what does that look like? Yeah. And that's another thing I guess I forgot to mention is that by, by moving the class, it's also going to be tied into my CTE pathway. And in that pathway, there's a lot of options. We purchased the curriculum from the Northwest um, Carpenters Institute and the, the curriculum for the construction class. And because we purchased that, it kind of opens up a lot of windows um, for opportunities to get our program certified as a free apprenticeship program. And for kids that complete three credits within the pathway, um, they get sort of preferential um, placement onto the official apprenticeship list that they wouldn't otherwise be able to get. Um, the only people that get prefer like the preferential points for the apprenticeship program are usually obtained through work for some sort of company and an 18 year old kid that's coming out of high school they really can't acquire that type of experience so working um you know in our classroom learning how to use the tools under our um under our you know watchful eye is going to give them a huge uh, um foot you know a huge uh, foot in the door i guess as far as getting into those high wage high demand apprenticeships um, that really very few 18 year olds get a chance to do that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's all we have for Tiger. And thank you, Tiger team. Proud to, proud to be here with you. Absolutely. Awesome. All right. Um, Andy Van Fleet from Fowler with Taylor Sire, who's online, and uh, to talk about your proposal. Excellent. Um, uh, we'll have a shorter presentation, which is one, one proposal. Uh, <laughs> The great work started in the high schools in about 2018. The uh, uh, on track program, on track for leaders, uh, was very successful. And we wanted to wrap around that same work and start even earlier in middle school. So we now have a crude proposal on the table. And I'll turn it over to Taylor Siren to share more about what this looks like. Hi. Am I coming through? Yep, we can hear you. Excellent. Um, so yeah, I'm working on um, basing my work off of the the same study out of the University of Chicago that the high school squad program is based off of, um, and then I'm working with the people in my same position at Tuality and Hazelbrook. So we're trying to, as much as our differing schedules allow, keep it aligned across the three middle schools so that we're offering students the same program. Um, the sort of aim of the class is that. We are capturing students who don't have, you know, identified reasons why they're struggling in school. They don't, you know, qualify for special ed services. They don't qualify for ELD services, but they're still not able to um, meet the grade level standards. And so we're trying to, you know, capture them in sixth grade so that by the time they leave us and do the eighth to ninth transition, they're students who don't need to access a program like SQUAD, so it'll free up space for more students to receive these supports. So the focus over the three years is going to be to build their um, executive functioning skills. So things like how do I figure out what my assignments are? How do I unpack directions? How do I check 
the work that I did against the rubric that my teacher gave me, how do I like the metacognitive piece of how do I figure out when I'm confused or when I'm stuck and what I'm stuck on and who do I reach out to and what are the supports that I can access? <clears throat> and then um, some social emotional stuff. So I wanna focus on building their emotional vocabulary and building their ability to identify their own emotional state. And then once they can do that, work on some self-regulation skills. And then the last piece is the academic success. Um, so, you know, it, it might be like a targeted reteaching of a math concept that they didn't get, or there was an assignment that like almost nobody did. And so we can do it all together as a class. Um, I, you know, when I, have worked with them previously, I'll pair them up so that they're grouped so that, you know, these three kids are all working on an assignment together so that they can start to rely on each other and build community. Um, and then that's the last piece of it is its cohort model. So the sixth graders that we've identified will stay with each other and with me through seventh and eighth grade. So they'll have an adult in the school that has their back, you know, all the way through, and they'll have peers that they get to know really well, and hopefully a space where they can show up and be vulnerable and talk through the things that they're struggling with and get support from me and from their peers. Questions, comments? Yeah, Director Irvin. First of all, I love that so much um, and feel like a lot of those things, especially around emotional vocabulary and um, some of that executive functioning, pretty much in, as a formal middle school teacher, all of our kids could use and some adults. <laughs> um, so I love that. And I think that's really fantastic. Do you have a way that you are or what is the way that you're identifying or trying to rein in those kids that would best be suited for that? program that class? Um, so in my role as student success coordinator at Fowler, one of the other pieces of my job outside of working with this small cohort of students is supporting our tier two and three systems. And so I've been developing the data protocols that we use to identify students who um, need tier two level supports. And that's, you know, mostly the same group of students that I'm targeting. We tried to um, identify like 50% of kids who were solidly tier two, 25% who were tier three, and then 25% who were kind of on the cusp who could maybe be our like leaders and models, but who still needed some layers of support. Um, did I answer your question? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. Excellent. Thank you, Taylor. Yeah. So I oh, sorry, one, we do one more so is, is the assumption with this crew program that then those same kids would fold into the Abbott program possibly or the I'm sorry, the um ah the other program. The squad. The squad. squad. Thank you. Not necessarily or the hope is that they won't need to, that they'll have the skills by the time they uh, leave eighth grade, that they wouldn't need to access the squad program so that other students could receive those supports. Which is exciting because we haven't had that opportunity for that, that kind of focus leading into this. So, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so I'd also like to introduce Melissa Glick, who is associate principal at Walton High School, new to this process as well. Glad to have you, Melissa, and she'll be talking about highlights for some of the courses um, <coughs> in front of you coming up of tour. So, Melissa, I'm going to switch this your way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. All right. Okay. So, I, I tried to kind of group our new course proposals so that it, you could kind of understand the different categories that they fall into. So, the first one falls under the information and technology pathway. And these, class, these new classes are really stemming from the fact that we have two new staff members that have joined and they're really interested in kind of rethinking and reinvigorating our information and technology pathway. So the first new course would be the Freshman Wheel Exploration for Computer Science. And this is really supposed to be established to help students get that base of computer science skills and give them the options or the information that they would need so that they can continue on with any of the other kind of options and ultimately at the end of the progression receive a certification um, in information and technology. And so that freshman wheel class is gonna be that base. Um, and then some of the options that they would kind of be able to go into is 
what is currently considered code combat would be integrated into game design program. That's not a new course, but that kind of sets the, the scene for what game design two that course is building off of. Um, and that was proposed due to the popularity and interest in the game design one class. And so this class is really established to help students think like a game designer and explore the design process through activities and projects. Um, another kind of course in this house is the broadcast technology course. I think it might be listed as game technology or game broadcast technology, but the official kind of title is going to be broadcast technology. Um, and that's connected to students that are currently doing the broadcast technology work, but they're doing it outside of school time. And so that's coming in in the videos that we're seeing. And when we create it into a course, it really helps the students explore that a little bit deeper and more fully, and also create more opportunity for students that might be doing things after school or outside of school to be, still be able to participate in this. Um, the last two courses are app design. So that's when students are gonna learn how to think like a user-centered and user interface app designer and explore the design process and web design. And that class begins by exploring the design process as well, but including the language of the internet, so HTML and CSS. And students will develop and create their websites for users to address real world needs. So those are kind of all under the information technology pathway. Should I continue or pause? Or pause a little bit. Okay. Questions? All right, let's keep rolling through. All right, uh, so the next kind of category is health slash CTE. So we're looking at creating a sports medicine pathway in our existing medical careers area. Um, and so this is also hopefully gonna provide multiple ways for students to earn health credits. Um, and ultimately, I think they're hoping also that this could end uh, in certification for our students. So sports medicine, students are gonna gain that new understanding and interest in the human body and explore emergency medicine, like splinting and spine boarding, et cetera. Um, and the second one in this category is sports nutrition and concepts of strength and conditioning. So that's again, kind of a, that body systems um, investigation, but also thinking, you know, how we're fueling an athlete's body, um, how we can design and alter strength and conditioning programs to serve, um, to serve athletes. Um, so that's that area. The next kind of section is, it's just one, one new course, but we're still excited about it. Uh, event planning and venue management. And so this is the first course and what we're also hoping to be uh, a new pathway for our hospitality area. Currently we have a really wonderful program for culinary, um, but we're looking into event planning to build out an event management kind of pathway as well. And so this is the first course that we're hoping will culminate in its third year in an integrated capstone project with the culinary and business program and have students start to be able to put on events both at the school and in the larger community. Um, and then the last course is the history of popular music. So what is pop music? How has it changed in the time from the mid-1950s to the early 1990s? It's that integration of, of history and music. And that course is really intended to hopefully capture the interest of some students that might be taking releases. And instead of having them release, maybe say, hey, here's this kind of great, interesting course that we hope you're really interested in. Um, to kind of keep building your skills. Those are all of our questions. Awesome. Questions or comments, board members? Vice Chair Lynn. Thank, thank you for presenting those courses. Um, are there opportunities uh, to connect with the community colleges or um, four year universities for dual credit opportunities like they talked about with Tiger? Yeah, so I know specifically for the, the health one, they're looking to go for dual credit, and the teachers are currently looking at becoming dual credit certified. Um, and that's something that I think we could look into in terms of for the information technology pathway and the event planning. I know specifically I've spoken with one of the teachers already about starting to look into dual credit certification. Good question. Other questions? I, I have a question outside of the Dalton High School um, courses specifically. Up in the, the top part of the cover page, it mentions course deletions, and I didn't see any listed. Yeah, so the deletions actually are something that all had for around 24. Um, part of the work we're looking at those, it's not quite there yet. Okay. But yes, we'll, we'll have that in. So 
everything working as possible against that. Anything that we have not been populated for the last or probably last three years that most possible in both sides. We'll share with you. And then my oh sorry. My second strictly procedural question is, do you actually want us to read the entire list of courses or can we just say as presented when we get around to the motion? Yeah, it's a great question. I, uh, probably left there. I saw that. That's, That's why I'm asking the question. Are you just being mean or are you actually mean? <laughs> <laughs> Not knowing exactly how you mean. Thank you, um, I just want to say how excited I am about these courses, especially on uh, Career and Technical Education yes. Month that uh, we sit on uh, this month. And so I just wanted to say thank you for bringing these courses to us and for offering these opportunities for our students. And I would be remiss if I didn't point out I saw a couple of course proposals from our very own Thor. Uh, so very cool to see you doing that work <laughs> and teaching students how to do this work. It's so cool. Cool thing to see. And so now the, the key part is getting kids to forecast for these classes. So that's that's going to be so that's on you, Henry. We need you to talk to all of your fellow students and tell them what amazing classes are going to be offered if they forecast for them. All right. Uh, with that, I believe uh, it would be appropriate for someone to make a potentially very long motion. Mm -hmm. Or maybe not. Well, somebody can tell us first that we must read all the facts. All right. the time do is going to just I move that the Tiger Trolling School Board approves the class new course list as presented. Second. Motion has been made by Director Zershmeed and seconded by Director Jaime. Is there any discussion on the motion? Thank you all for making the time to be here tonight to present. And for the folks joining us on Zoom, too, we really appreciate it. Uh, with that, we'll move to a quorum vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. All opposed, say nay. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, congratulations and thank you for your work on this. Okay, uh, with that, we will move on. Actually, you know what? It's 8.30. Uh, we've officially been going for two hours, so let's take a uh, recess. Uh, we'll take a seven-minute recess, let people take a break, and then we'll come back with uh, Director Bernard to talk about technology. Okay, seven-minute recess.
I got it. Okay. All right. I will reconvene the meeting at 8.35 p.m. and we will pick up where we left off with uh, action item B, 2017 bond technology purchase, program lab, iPads, and computer purchase with Director Susan Bernard. Director Bernard. Good evening, uh, Board Chair Bowman and Vice Chair Lynn and members of the board. Um, I have been here year after year talking about the 2017 bond. Thank you so much to our community. Um, we are at our cycle again to purchase equipment for our students and our staff and our program labs. We usually do it a little bit later in the year, but due to some of our supply chain issues, we're doing it a little bit earlier this year so we can be sure to have our equipment here in time to pass out and replace. Um, one of the things I wanted to make sure to note, um, and I know most are aware, if not all, that our 2017 bond had $18 million in um, technology funds that gets us through um, 2024. So we'll have an opportunity to do this for another two years, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, but the $18 million that we're using for the recycling and the replacement plan is coming from bond funds. So I know we're thinking about that in the next round, um, but wanted to make sure that that was also something that we are all thinking about as we depend on technology even more and more each day. Um, so this year we'll be replacing two elementary schools. Um, we'll be replacing our seventh grade, next year seventh grade middle schoolers. And then we are on a cycle where all incoming ninth graders receive a device and then upon graduation, um, because those devices are at our um, uh, decision to is, are obsolete or they would be recycled anyway, graduate the students can take them with them. And then this year we are also uh, replacing one computer lab at Tigard High School and then we'll be replacing our staff laptops. And those laptops will then move on to other staff members in our school district that are learning to use technology quite a bit um, that we didn't normally issue devices to. So the last two years have been an example of that with distance learning, but also during that process, they've used um, a lot of the job that they're doing has become more digital and they've learned to use some of the tools more efficiently. And so we've got more people using um, personal laptops and personal or TTSD devices to do their job. So I am here this evening to request um, the funds and the approval to purchase these devices for our students and our staff. Any questions or comments for Director Bernard? This has been before us in the past, I know, so we uh, engaged with it a bit, but yeah, questions. Vice Chair Lynn. I'll, I'll move, sir. Sure. I'm like just getting started. I move that the board approve the purchase of iPads for students, staff, laptops, and program lab purchase with 2017 bond funds and authorize the district superintendent or CFO to sign the purchase order to Apple Incorporated in an amount of $1,934,473. Thank you. I second, and if I can just add, I am so grateful to the uh, community that voted for this bond. I've said it, I think, every year as we've done this. And um, with COVID, it became absolutely obvious to all of us how very important technology is for our students. And so keeping them all up to date is hugely important. So I'm happy to be seconding tonight. Yes. And the way that it's been managed to have this cycle without falling through the cracks is really top notch and exciting for our students and teachers. Any further discussion? Yeah, just thank you so much. Uh, you know, having been a teacher when COVID started, having um, the students already training how to use iPads, it was uh, it was game changing. So thank you so much for all your hard work and to the voters for the ball. Of course, yes. Okay, with that we'll move to a quorum vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Director Bernard. Um, okay, with that, we'll move on to action item C. This is a vote on the matter from the January 24th, 2022 executive session. Um, so on January 24th, 2022, the board met in executive session under ORS 192.6602B to consider the dismissal or disciplining of or to hear complaints or charges brought against a public officer, employee, staff member, or agent unless he or she requests an open meeting, which they did not. 
Specific minutes from that executive session will not be made public, but the board is required by Oregon public meeting law to make its decision in an open session. So to be clear, we will not be discussing the matter in this meeting, but we are required to vote on it in a public meeting. So with that, is there a motion? I move that the Tiger Dwelton School District Board of Education upholds the superintendent's recommendation regarding the personnel matter discussed in executive session on January 24, 2022. Motion's been made by Director Zerchmead. Is there a second? Okay. Motion's been made by Director Zerchmead and seconded by Director Urban. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, I'll move to a roll call vote uh, and I'll go down the board. Uh, Director Zerchmead. Aye. Vice Chair Lynn. Aye. Director Urban. Aye. Director Jimenez. I abstain. And I will vote aye for a vote of four to zero to one. The motion passes. Okay, with that, we will uh, move on to our next action item. This is City of Tigard Construction Excise Tax Intergovernmental Agreement uh, with presenter, Director David Moore. Good evening, Chair Bowman and members of the board. Uh, this evening, uh, we're presenting an amended uh, intergovernmental agreement with the city of Tiger to uh, collect and remit the construction excise tax on the district's behalf, uh, taking us back to uh, 2007. The legislature um, initiated uh, the construction excise tax law uh, on behalf of school districts to uh, implement for those that chose to do this. And the Tiger Twalton School Board um, did vote um, back at that time to implement the tax. And uh, so the district signed multiple IGAs or intergovernmental agreements with the, the local jurisdictions to collect and remit the tax on the district's behalf. And so this is, the collection is tied uh, at the building department level with the building permit process and it's um, square foot based. So for example, in the current year, uh, the board each year readopts the rates uh, as uh, adopted by the Department of Revenue. And in the current year, like for a residence uh, being newly built or add on to a, a current residence is $1.41 per square foot. So you take it a 2000 square foot house that adds $2,800 onto the, the building permit process in that case. Um, the reason why we're bringing this forward at this time is related to the upcoming agenda item, the development agreement with Taylor Morrison. And um, this item, uh, this change uh, being proposed to the agreement is a key element of the development agreement because currently um, the IGA, uh, in this case with the city of Tigard, does not account for exemptions or waiver except those that are part statute. And um, this gives the district and the board the latitude uh, to waive or exempt uh, construction excise tax in cases where uh, the district has an agreement with an individual or an entity um, that's developing. And um, the, the board approves an agreement between those two parties, the district and the other party to, to do a particular waiver. So, uh, the primary new language to the IGA is at the bottom of section four, and it basically formalizes what I just explained. Um, and there's, we did some other updates uh, related to contact information, because this was again put in place back in 2008. Um, so some of the people that were mentioned in the agreement are no longer part of the city or the, the district staff. And we had uh, our attorney 
proposed and review language, the city attorney proposed and review language, so we're in agreement uh, with the city on this. I'll stop there and see if there's any questions. I think some of us were able to have our own discussions and questions with um, Dr. Ricky Smith in advance. My understanding from this, just to clarify, is we're essentially codifying into the language what we have a legal right to do based on statute. Correct. Okay. Other questions? Uh, do you have further on this item, uh, Director Moore, or would it be appropriate for a vote? No, I think it's appropriate for a vote. Okay. And entertain a motion. I move to approve IGA to collect and remit construction excise tax between the Tigard 12th and School District 23J and the City of Tigard as presented. Motion's been made by Director Irvin. Second. And seconded by Vice Chair Lynn. Any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, we'll move to a choral vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Motion passes. Uh, all right, Director Moore, on to the next item, the Taylor Morrison Development Agreement. Yeah, so for this agenda item, I think we have some guests virtually um, that have been invited as panelists. I'm going to introduce those folks. They're available at the meeting here to ad address any questions, especially on the technical side of things when it comes to construction and such. Um, looks like we have... Christine Taylor uh, from Miller Nash uh, Law Firm. Christine uh, was responsible for a lot of the drafting of the language. It's part of the, the development agreement. We're asking the board to consider for approval this evening uh, on behalf of the district. And we have Debbie Pearson uh, from DACPM, our project manager. And we're also expecting a representative from, and Curtis is there too, Curtis Houston. He's a vice president from Taylor Morrison. So uh, he's uh, who our team was working with, along with uh, Taylor Morrison's attorney, Seth King, uh, to uh, come to agreement after several months of, of discussions uh, with, uh, with both parties. And um, in a nutshell, I'm gonna be brief about what this means. I think we've, we've given some prior communication to the board on this, but um, we are uh, planning to open uh, Art Rocking Elementary School fall of 2023. And um, this didn't quite line up with um, some of the infrastructure development that would normally be um, performed by uh, the developer, in this case, Taylor Morrison, in the, on the property adjacent to our property to bring key utilities and a street to the to the uh, the school site, primarily on the, the northwest sites or uh, boundaries of the, the school site. And so uh, we have we started having discussions in 2021. Um, with um, Curtis on behalf of Taylor Morrison and um, came to agreement uh, to draft this development agreement. And um, basically what it does is it um, accelerates um, Taylor Morrison's uh, construction schedule when it comes to this um, infrastructure uh, about a year earlier than they were expecting to perform it. And um, in, in exchange for that, um, we are, the district is providing an incentive, um, not a normal cash incentive. Um, it's made up of uh, first uh, credits uh, for system development charges that we have been credited by the city of Tiger on, the, on our project uh, to the tune of about $677,000. The maximum incentive would be 1.2 million and the balance between that 1.2 million and 677,000 is made up of uh, the waivers or exemptions related to construction excise tax, which we just discussed under the, the prior agenda item. So um, I'm gonna stop there, make sure there's no questions right now and see if there's anything I need to add. And, we also have, like I said, the experts um, in the virtual world out there to, to answer the technical questions. So 
So my, my question, I might have additional questions, but my question is, so we're granting these system of development charge credits and CET waivers. Where would those dollars have showed up in our budget um, yeah. had they not been granted? So it's in, um, Debbie Pearson could probably uh, explain some of the details of how those dollars originated, but it's, um, we, the, the city grants credits against the normal system development charges that apply to our project. In our case, it's 677,000. What we learned from the city is uh, we would have to, to use those in the future. We would have to have a, a city of Tiger, Tiger project to, to apply those to. We don't have any current bond projects you know, of this magnitude being planned. We're at the tail end of the bond. I don't remember when Debbie said they would expire otherwise, but um, the other piece is with the construction excise tax, that would be, you know, five to $600,000 we would bring into our construction excise tax fund. So we would forego those. Um, there were other um, options and types of agreements discussed. Um, overall, we saw this as the, the, uh, the most economical from the district standpoint, uh, Taylor Morrison standpoint, and the, the families are going to be purchasing those homes and hopefully sending their kids to our school. And had we budgeted for, had we budgeted for those CET dollars in another way that we're going to have to make shifts to accommodate? No, we've been fortunate with the CET dollars. At the, at the front end of this bond, we allocated some of those dollars to, to supplement project budgets, um, but we use very little of those um, because we had uh, pricing on projects came in better than projected in some cases. And we also had, um, we had, um, lost my train of thought real quick, but I'll come back to it. Um, we had the, we had the second bond sale in June of 2019, and we realized another $20 million in bond premium to provide additional contingency for projects. So we didn't have to depend on construction excise tax to the, the level we thought we initially would for these bond projects. And overall, um, you know, we've been in the middle of the bonds. We haven't had uh, capital needs outside of the bonds to apply those CET dollars to in the last few years. That's helpful. Thank you. Other questions from the board? Okay. Is there, I don't know if um, I, I want to give Curtis the opportunity to introduce himself, and, and it's been a, a partnership and, and a process, and we've appreciated it with Taylor Morrison work. Glad to be this spot this evening. I know Dr. Ricky Smith is will be jumping out of her chair when this is signed. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah, Curtis, would you like to introduce yourself to the board and maybe say a few remarks? Sure. Thank you, David. Uh, my name is Curtis Houston, um, the vice president of land acquisition and, and development for Taylor Morrison. And Really just want to echo what David said. I mean, it's been a, a very long process and wanted to thank everybody that was involved, um, Christine, Debbie, and, and everybody on the TTSD uh, side of the table. So it's it's taken us quite a bit of time to, to get to where we are. And, you know, I'm I'm proud of the the agreement that we've come up with. And I think that it's it's something that can benefit both parties and ensure that the that the school gets open on time. So really it's it's from from our side of the table it's just appreciation for all the hard work that went into the agreement. Thank you. Okay. Anything further on this David or now appropriate for us? We've given you all the information hopefully you need. Okay. Now entertain a motion. I move to adopt resolution 2122-13, approving Tiger 12 School District 23J to execute a development agreement with Taylor Morrison Northwest LLC. Okay. Motion's been made by Director Zerchme. Second. And seconded by Director Jimes. Any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, we'll move to a coral vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Perfect.
Thank you very much. Uh, motion passes unanimously. Uh, Curtis, thank you very much. Debbie, um, we appreciate you all being with us on the Zoom. Um, with that, we'll move on to our next action item, uh, Tiger High School Theater Stage Rigging Equipment and Curtain for Placement. Uh, Director Moore. Uh, yeah, so this uh, was one of the projects uh, related to one of the projects uh, we brought forward to the board as part of the bond prioritization work session in, in December. And I know our um, thespians at Tiger, 12, or Tiger High School are, are gonna be happy that we, we get this project off the ground. I, I've heard from one individually myself. And um, so, um, this is related to the rigging system and the curtains at the theater stage at Tigard High. And we've had them shut down, so they haven't been able to use that system for performances um, due to safety and, and disrepair uh, conditions. And so we're asking the board uh, to approve a contract with stagecraft. And side note to the, the stagecraft, contract that's being proposed. Um, we work with our, our public contracting attorney to classify this as a sole source procurement because the outreach uh, that the operations department did to try to get quotes um, to do this work um, were incomplete except for, for Stagecraft. And Stagecraft was the original vendor uh, back in the 80s when the previous system was put in and they do a lot of the work um, in all industries related to the theaters. And um, so we're asking the board uh, to consider a contract with Stagecraft to complete this work this summer. It'll be a, like we said before, a bond project. And um, I've got to get through the hundred and some pages of the development agreement to get <laughs> to the right agenda item here, so I don't misspeak on the amounts. Bear with me. I think it's page 101. Which page is it? It's 101, 101. or 102 on the PDF. Yeah, so the total amount uh, between the rigging equipment Curtains replacement is $277,930. So this has been uh, bit a bit under prevailing wage. And um, we're asking the, the board to consider the approval of the contract. Not Questions or comments? Yeah. Can you remind me what was the, the budgeted amount we had in the, for the bond for these curtains? Um, I could if I had the December 13th board pack in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> I remember um, that. I don't think it was, right, it was very that. little, if anything. It was maybe the curtains, I think, initially. 20,000 for the curtains. Yeah. And we talked back in December, we talked about the other resources that would be available for the, the bond prioritized projects that haven't been completed yet. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions? I do kind of like that way this is through a company that we've worked with before and whose yeah. product is held up. Um, and that's that's a good thing. I didn't, sorry. I was just sure, saying, but... I, I like to mention that this is the company that installed the existing <coughs> ones. We've worked with them before and the product has been um, high quality. So I like that it's a good thing, I think. I like that they're the only ones who offer uh, fun <laughs> retardant curtains too. Yeah, sure. All right, uh, I would entertain a motion. I move to approve the award of contract to Stagecraft Industries Inc. for the Tiger High School Theater stage rigging equipment and curtain replacement for a total amount of $277,930. Motions are made by Director Thirschmeen. Second. Seconded by Director Jaimes. Uh, any further discussion on the motion? All right, we will move to a choral vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Motion carries unanimously. That will take us to our final action item of the evening, the Northwest Regional Education Service District Annual Report. 
and resolution 2122-14 authorizing NWRESD local service plan. Director Moore. I, yes, this is a, a annual request to the board that's uh, required and it, it basically sets the foundation for the ESD's budget for 2022-23. And um, the superintendents in the three county area, the North, Northwest region, including Dr. Ricky Smith meet um, as a group uh, usually in November, I think it was November this year, and um, discuss the, the service plan for the ensuing year uh, as far as services provided to the, the local districts um, by the ESD. And um, this has been a, a approved by the group of superintendents. The ESD board approved the plan in December. So now it's time for the local school districts to approve the plan and it's required to be approved by two thirds of the districts representing 50% of the, at least 50% of the students in the three county area. So uh, the ESD's annual report and the resolution plan is one document it's linked in the, the board materials and the annual report really applies to last year. That's the last complete year and the resolution plan applies to next year. So um, the, the way, since we have new board members, I wanna make sure you understand how the dollars flow um, related to the ESD share of the state school fund. The ESDs in Oregon receive four and a half percent of the state school fund. Uh, the K-12 districts receive uh, the other 95 and a half percent. And then the, the dollars that flow to the ESD, um, they get to keep 10% to cover their, basically their operating costs, their administration operating costs. The other 90% is distributed to the districts. Uh, the 90% is broken down by 75% uh, in what's called resolution services. So it's basically a menu of, of services the district can choose from to spend um, their portion of that 90% or that 75%. In our case, we spend most of the dollars on uh, special education services and technology services. The other 25% is what the ESD calls core services. So they're central services at the ESD level that all districts uh, benefit from. So it could be a network engineer, perhaps or something. Um, that's something we may not use as often in service up because we have internal IT staff, but I couldn't think of a better example off the top of my head. But with, for Tiger Tualatin, we're due to receive, um, you know, for the, the service credits, uh, just over $4.2 million next year. That's about a 3% increase over this year. And um, the other pass-throughs to uh, the districts include what's called a county allocation, which basically could be for services, or we could just take it as cash. Um, and our portion is 433,000, an increase of 409,000 in the current year. And um, the core services that benefit all districts went up um, to 4.8 million compared to 4.6 million. So that's my quick 101 session on ESD funding. My recollection was last year, the, the budget ask increased pretty substantially. And this seems like a much more modest. Increase. Yeah, what happened last year is the ESD has to start their work in the fall when they meet with the superintendents. Think back to fall a year ago, the governor's budget was at 9.1 right. billion. And so they were they based their budget on that. Um, when everything was said and done, it was 9.3 billion state school funds. So what they did is they held us, they upped the amount um, for the current year by holding this harmless from the budget. Got it. Got it. That's that makes sense. Makes sense. Any other questions or comments for Director Moore? All right, I'd entertain a motion. Okay. Yes, I'd like to.
Uh, I move that the Tiger Tarleton Board of Directors adopts resolution 2122-14 authorizing uh, NWRESD local service plan for 2022-23 as presented. Motions are made by Vice Chair Lynn. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> <laughs> Seconded by Director Jaime's by a hair. Uh, any yeah. further discussion on the motion? All right, we'll move to a coral vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Director Moore. Um, okay, so we will move to our final agenda item of the evening, public comment. This public comment is reserved for uh, non-agenda items uh, and any rollover from the initial public comment, uh, of which there is none tonight. So. As I've mentioned before, I'll briefly just run through our board meetings, our public meetings, open to the public to observe, but regular public comment is a policy choice of the board, not a legal requirement. Um, public comments are limited to three minutes each and should be brief and concise. No criticism of specific personnel will be heard, neither will commendations of specific district personnel. Uh, please wear your mask while speaking. Please share your zip code. Director Zershmead will be timing. Uh, if you would like your public comment in the meeting minutes, please share the, the uh, written comments with Patty Roberts, board secretary. Uh, this is an opportunity for the board to listen and not engage in dialogue. And we welcome all comments at any time to be submitted via the board email. So with that, I'll call, I'll, we'll walk through our list of signups. First sign up is McKenna Baker. Don't see McKenna. Our next sign up is Joey Baker. Our next sign up is Everett Chino. Our next sign up is Candice Parfit. Our next comment is Tara Robinson. So none of our in person sign ups are, were here. Uh, do we sure. know? Can, um, Mr. Chino and Candice Parfit, they submitted written comments, okay. so they will be. In the minutes. Perfect. Thank you, Patty. So two public comments have been left in writing. Those will be included in the minutes and reviewed by board members. Um, do we know if Kelly Horsford is on the Zoom? Yes. Perfect. Okay, then uh, Kelly, were you able to hear? Oh, it seems like she's not in there. She's been watching on YouTube. Great. Hi, Kelly. It looks like we just let you into the Zoom. Um, can you hear us? I can. Here, let me get my video on. Hi. Hi. Uh, perfect. So were you able to hear the spiel from either earlier in the meeting or this most recent one? Yes, I am familiar. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, then uh, please share your zip code when you start speaking. And then once you begin talking is when um, Director Searchman will begin timing. So with that, okay. the floor is yours. Thank you. Zip code is 97062. Good evening, my name is Kelly Horsford and I'm a product of TTSD. I attended kindergarten at the prior Tualatin Elementary School, went to Bridgeport, Tualatin Junior High School and graduated from Tigard High School in 1993, the last class before the Tualatin High School opened. We moved back to Tualatin the summer before our oldest daughter, Mahela, started kindergarten. We wanted our girls to attend TTSD. Like so many families, we chose this district because we believe in this community and the education that is accessible to all the students in our district. Our youngest daughter, Violet, received SPED services. A few years ago, her IEP wasn't being followed. I had to advocate tirelessly for what we agreed she needed to access her education. It was a nightmare for our family, traumatized my daughter and affected relationships with other students and their families, and ultimately sowed seeds of distrust with the district. Our older daughter, Mahela, is a seventh grader at Hazelbrook. She was tagged in third grade in math and language arts. Tag services have been minimal over the years. However, she was online for her fifth and sixth grade years. Very recently, we found out that she hasn't been receiving tag services in any of her core classes. Thankfully, she is in advanced math, but it's been confirmed that none of her core teachers are offering differentiated teaching at her level and rate of learning. So I find myself once again in a position to advocate for services that TTSD is not giving my daughter, despite them being agreed upon for her to access her education. 
I typically maintain that everyone here, teachers and staff, have the very best intentions and are dedicated to our youth and invested in the well being of our students. However, we have a system wide failure to support students in TAG. It's my understanding that tiered classes have been eliminated and the differentiated teaching and learning will take place in the classrooms. Unfortunately, teachers haven't been properly equipped with the scaffolding and support to teach at the different levels and rates. I acknowledge that this pandemic has turned everything upside down and we're all tired and we're all hopefully doing the best we can. But as you know, issues with TAG were brought to the board's attention before the pandemic. My kiddo has been bored to tears this year and truthfully for the last few years. This school year, I was reassured numerous times that she was receiving services. I trusted what I was told and I strive to give the benefit of the doubt during this wild time. When it comes to closing the achievement gap and providing educational equity and excellence, we must include our TAG students. I'm disappointed to be back in the position where I have to advocate and push for services. My ultimate goal is that this will not just help my students, but all students. And I plan to come back in May to a board meeting and I hope to share how quickly things were remedied. Thanks you guys. All right, thank you very much for the comment. Um, I anticipate that uh, either Dr. Ricky Smith or someone from the team will, will follow up. The board has had presentations on TAG in the past and it might be time to have another progress report. So thank you, Kelly. Um, with that, um, I see some folks uh, just joined us. Welcome to the board meeting. Um, I'm guessing the Baker family? Perfect. Okay, so um, the first up, I have McKenna Baker. Um, so McKenna, come on up to the front. So while you're walking up, I'll give an overview of how the process works just for a minute. You can take a seat. Um, the microphone on the table is that black thing. As long as the green light is on, you'll be live. So basically you'll have uh, three minutes to provide public comment. Uh, that's Director Jill Zershmi. She's got cards over there where she'll hold up to tell you how much time you have left. Um, before you start, start speaking, we'll ask you to share your zip code just so we know if you live in the district. Um, we, we do need to emphasize that in our public comments, we're not allowed to hear criticism of specific individuals in the district. So please don't use any names of individuals. However, you are of course allowed to criticize district programs or provide feedback. Um, we also can't hear praise for specific individuals. Those should be done privately as well. Uh, let's see here. Um, if you have written um, uh, comments, you can share those with Patty Roberts and we'll include them in the official meeting minutes, but the meeting recording will include your comments. Uh, also public comment is an opportunity for the board to listen, not an opportunity for dialogue. Um, so we will be listening. And of course you can follow up and provide additional comments via email at any time. Does that make sense? Okay, so I will hand the floor over to you and your three minutes will start as soon as you begin speaking. So take your time. You don't have to say your address, just share your zip code and then your name uh, and affiliation would be great to get it started. 97062. Thank you. Um, my name is Rebecca Baker. I am here because I am in a class AGS3. Um, and since the beginning of the year, we have had a shortage of teachers, obviously. However, um, throughout the year, we have not had a designated teacher. We have constantly switched teachers. Uh, we have not had a teacher longer than about four weeks. Um, this has been very frustrating for <laughs> the whole class, really, um, because we are, when we first got our supposed official uh, uh, teacher, we were three units, four units behind the other AGS3 classes. Um, we were promised that after our last teacher, we would not be changing teachers. And by the second semester, um, when the schedules changed, we also switched that promised teacher. Um, we, as a class, have voiced, both students and parents have come and voiced our uh, issue, our frustrations with the um, situation because our class has seeked absolutely no help. Um, we have not been supported in any way, shape or form. We have basically been a self-teaching class um, because every time we switch a teacher, it is a new, speech, a new teaching style and we are unable to track or keep up. Half of the class is not even trying to get A's at this point, they are just trying to pass. And this is a huge issue. 
we are, I'm here on behalf of my whole class because we have come forward and we have said that we are will, the students are even willing to help come up with ideas and nothing has changed. And this is a huge issue and it needs to be addressed. Um, we are willing to, as a class, um, come up with solutions and we are trying to help each other, but at this point we really need support and we are having a huge lack of that in the school. Kenna, thank you for your advocacy. Um, we appreciate it. And with that, I will move to our next public comment, which is from Joey Baker. Thank you for being here. Same spiel applies. Um, please share your zip code to begin. And then once you start speaking, director search will begin with that. Thank you. Um, 97062. My name is Joey Baker. I am a parent of McKenna Baker. Um, McKenna has a unique situation where the second week of her freshman year, sitting eating lunch, she um, was hit in the head by another student it was completely the accident, but she was unable to speak for several days afterwards. The concussion was so bad. When she did speak, she had she had a um, accent for several months. For the last two and a half years, she's been in and out of uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, uh, and it has affected her long term, short term memory of being able to retain things and because of this she has panic attacks all going back to this one concussion so she is in a in a, a unique situation on top of being in a class whose teacher keeps changing whose curriculum keeps changing they can't keep up i feel that especially going into the second semester, that they have no foundation to continue their education into this class. And how many people in this class are behind? How many people have a no grade this semester because there's been no consistency and no structure in the class? I'm concerned not only for my own child, but for every child in that classroom, that they have an opportunity to be caught up, to be caught up with their peers, to not fall behind, and to be supported. And I understand these last several years have been difficult for everybody. And I and I recognize that. But I would like to see going forward, thank you. Um, some type of foundation, either a small lesson plan instead of a, a larger lesson and then being able to follow up and do classroom work instead of homework because when they get home i can't help with the ags i'm going to be honest <laughs> i see certain things and i can go oh i can do that i can do that and then it turns the page and i'm like i can't do that um so i feel there are a lot of students in the same situation where they have parental units that that can help only so far but we can't we can't do it at home because we don't know how. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you listening. I appreciate Ms. Roberts today helping me navigate this whole situation. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I will just say before you all leave that I want, I want to thank you for your, the respectfulness uh, and the way in which you presented yourselves. I think it speaks highly of you and your family. So thank you for being here and for presenting this way. Um, expect outreach from probably someone from 12 high school. Yes, um, going that in direction. Okay, so thank you for coming. Um, okay, with that, uh, board members, any final thoughts? Then we will adjourn our meeting at 9.20 p.m.